I always say it's all about the magic. And the magic is both emotional and hopefully uh, some sort of physical or visceral response to a work of art. I work in bronze, I work in wood, I play with mud, I call it ceramics. Why glass? Um, there's many reasons, and some are more complicated than others. I'm drawn to the teamwork and the magic that it presents itself in the elemental and physics sense. Do you realize that this, every one of these pieces was at one point 2,125 degrees and it was just a pool. And with my intent, focus, a lot of hard earned money, it is so expensive to work in hot glass. It's, it's insane per day what it costs to get a team of five or six people and go into a hot shop and make something and hope that you're going to make something really cool because uh, it doesn't always work out like that. There's a chemistry and the physics behind glass. There's a window of time where you are working between the phases of matter, between a solid and a liquid. And because of myself and my team, we enable that window and we protract that window and we create a workspace that this viscous 2,000 degree glass is working its phases. It doesn't care about us. It's doing its own thing. It's giving off its energy. It's cooling. It's hardening. It's stiffening. And yet I'm trying to some, sculpt something grave, graceful, something with balance or some, you know, something completely unglass like from a material that wants to take the shape of its container. That's what a liquid does. It just wants to settle down. Let all those electrons kind of even out. Get some space around them, no one bumping in, you know? So it's really this lovely, lovely window where um, humanity has been able to find that they can protract it, expand upon it. And I've, I'll spend six hours, seven hours nonstop on a piece. My career started in art school. I was trained as a classical artist at the Rhode Island School of Design. And this crazy guy who I had just switched into the glass department. And three weeks after I switched, this crazy guy named Dale Chihuly showed up. And I didn't even know who he was or what his work was. And everyone was like, you better figure that guy out. Like, uh, and he rolled in. And I, uh, it was Rich Royal and Ben Moore and Dale Chihuly were all there. And it literally changed my life. Because um, the teamwork was unbelievable. And we had this glory hole. It was only this big, but we never opened the big door. And every reheat, the big, we had like three people on doors. And Benny would just peel out these giant rondelles and fold out these clams. And he had his beret and his glasses. And he had his camel. He's always smoking these bareback camels, you know. And he's just like, it was just, and then Richie was slow hand, Luke is what I call him, because he was just so smooth starting these pieces. I mean, these are my heroes at, you know, so it was, not in, it was 1982, February 16th, that I took my first gather in glass. So when I saw Dale and his team just so smoothly, just everyone's orbiting around this object that's manifesting itself. I mean, it's really engaging. You're just kind of like, you know, it's almost like it's happening. It's like, it's kind of like, you know, everyone's patting the ball. You know, you ever play that game where you keep the ball in the air or you keep a balloon in the air? Well, imagine that cool game because everyone's got to run and everyone's laughing and you're trying to keep the balloon from hitting the ground. But instead of that, it blows up into a shape and it transfers and it gets a lip wrap and gets all this color and then <clears throat> just turns into this clam. Yeah, so Dale's a big part of my life. I sort of considered it my... Uh, my graduate studies, you know, he, uh, when we were seniors, we all got critiques with Dale and he said, Hey, come out to Seattle. And I, uh, you know, for a three week job and I packed my bags and I, uh, <laughs> packed my bags. I, I had a, a plate, a pot, a fork, a couple changes of clothes and my girlfriend, we had just been backpacking all around Europe. And I, 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 it's, I look back, I was 23 when I first called Dale and I said, Hey, we're moving out there. And he's like, Hey kid, this is a, this is a, Three week job. I was like, and I literally said, Dale, I'm a, I'm a big boy. Don't worry about me. I know it's just three weeks. And um, 
we moved out there and that girlfriend is my wonderful wife of 32 years and raised two kids in Seattle. And uh, I always say careers are cool, but raising a family is really the, that's been the best part of my life. I'm more of a traditional artist in the sense that I, I love to draw. You know, it gives me great pleasure this, to, because you have keen observation. When you're drawing, you're looking intently at the object. You're looking at the shadow. You're looking at the line. You understand line quality, how that, if from three dimension to two dimension, and, and how to capture that. Um, it's like playing the piano. It's just wonderful. I'm a very curious person. I mean, I love science. I'm constantly reading about physics and, you know, what's going on in the cosmos. The Imagine Museum has uh, an extraordinary collection of artists that have just dedicated their lives to um, their vision. And it's here to share with the public all the facets in compositions and the variety of types of art from the history of glass, which is just to make vessels and whole perfume, you know, originally, you know, these tiny little, such a rare commodity. People have so many curiosities that when you walk in, there's kiln casting, there's hot sculpting, there's engraving, there's encamo, there's just pure glass blowing. Uh, so, so there isn't, it's not a, um, it's not a line. It's not an either and or. It's like, it's, it's a, it's just a material. And it's, it's what are, what is mankind going to do with it? Or humankind, I, it, you know, what, what are we going to do with this material? And that has to do with the curiosity level and the focus of that group of folks that choose to work with it. Well, I, I call myself an intuitive artist. I'm working from my, how is this feeling? How is this piece making me feel? I want to cause, it's, it's it, you know, it's cause that, it's like, I, I, I'm, I, you know, like, I want my energy to be captured in my work and I want you to feel something. Uh, and, and so, um, you know, there's an idea, a theme and a story. And then if you get it, fantastic. If you don't, you certainly see something there and you, you have a concrete object that you can respond to. I'm very much a traditionalist. It's important to learn how to use tools and know how to use tools. It's very selfish. It, it simply makes me feel great. I mean, mind you, there's times where I hate it, you know? You ever got a third degree burn? That saw it hurts. You know, even a second degree, even if any kind of burn hurts. The Imagine Museum has given a lot of opportunities to many, many, many artists. You know, uh, Trish and her just um, true passion to collect and see and surround herself with works that just absolutely inspire her. You know, she has so much energy and focus. I mean, she's just a whirlwind. And uh, I just love the story of the museum where it was just, she just, you know, saw these incredible works of art and started acquiring them and then needed to showcase them. And she and Corey working together to amass this world-class collection. One of the purposes for the Imagine Museum is to tell the world that it's not a cup, it's not a window. There's a whole group of, of our society of artists that are challenging this material, that are taking it out of its comfort zone, bending, twisting, and breaking it, and putting their personality into it. Look at it, world. Look, there's something very special that's not very old, that is new, and it can be used in any way any artist choose, chooses to use it. I treat my career like an exploration. You know, uh, and, and I observe things and I observe the light and how the light is moving through them, reflecting off of them. What's the volume of the object? I'm always sort of looking at a new way of expressing myself. I'm not, I'm not committed to one, there's not one thing or shape that satisfies me. And it's, I sort of consider it part of my job is to explore new ideas and push the boundaries with what can this material do because we're still to this day learning. There are many people who are coming up with newer techniques and newer color applications or new color applications 
uh, that the great, you know, everyone thought that after in the Renaissance and the Venetians, you know, it, you know, if it wasn't done, it was done in Murano. Well, the American glass movement is a shake in the cage and really ruffled a lot of feathers because when Lino and Pino came over, they shared these secrets. Did you know that in, in Venice, that if it, Murano, if you got caught leaving, you were executed? If you made it to England or Germany, you were knighted? You know, because these secrets were so valuable. So... Um, there's a long time where people felt like the sort of this, this pinnacle, but this movement had such an inertia to it that everyone kept like, what's new? What can be done? What, how can I push it? When you look at the Sentinel, that's what I call expressionistic sculpting. You know, it's clear so you can look through it and you're seeing the silhouette is what defines it and the negative space is what defines it. It helps you see these the hands and the feet almost touching. And that is done by layering bits of glass and bits of glass and adding, just like I would if it were clay or wax. And it's a very traditional way of working that uh, through Pino Signoretto showed me, you know, it's glass blowing while you gather and gather and gather and gather. And then is everybody ready? This part's gonna be the torso and stop turning it. And while it's falling, I press the chest and the small of the back, and then we go quarter turn. There's the lat, and I make these marks on it. I sketch it. It's like I just, it's just like my sketchbook. I just mark, 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 mark. And then I have someone gathering the legs, the thigh section. And then we bring over the thigh section. I attach it. And then, and so suddenly now it is just a hybridized sculpting technique in hot glass. And it's very unique to my style. It's, and I call it expressionistic because the musculature isn't perfect, but the human form is something that we all idealize, that we all respond to. You can have your own personal reaction to it, um, and it can be it, it, it can be uh, heroic, it can be sexual, it can be nuanced, it can be uh, it, it it can start. You can use it to tell a story, almost like in a, a you know from a book where there's a character characters fallen into a situation. So you're curious about what is that situation. The human form is something you instantly identify with. And so when I'm working, I want to make sure there's the bone, you know, and then there's the musculature hanging off the bone because the softness in contrast to the hard bone is what makes a figure look real. So I call it expressionistic sculpting because I don't care if the pec is divided symmetrically. I don't care if you have the pec major, pec minor, the teres major, teres minor, subscapularis. Those don't matter to me. What matters is that uh, it looks like an arm. Yeah, I feel that. I feel that that arm is really, you're in that torso and you know, it's a strong arm, it's a weak arm or, uh, you know, so I'm using the figure to create a shape in space that defies gravity that tells the story about letting go. My work is really about expressing the motion. You see, if, it, if it's falling, there's no gravity and you're freezing time, okay? You're stopping in one millisecond of time in that position. And what I have learned is slow down. The only way to feel whole for me, and I'm not preaching here, is to quiet my mind, sit and be. And a flower is the, it's like the essence of life. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's like saying, you know, it's, it gets down to basics, like find me, you know, quick. Let's, you've got to fertilize. I've got, we've got, we've got a mate. It's essentially what's happening. And it's done in such a beautiful, delicate way and such a profound, simple way that we don't even see the sexuality half the time in it. Um, but it's the, you know, the procreation of that species and it's done in such an elaborate way. Um, and then we cut them and put them in vases and they're, they're just amazing. And, you know, life, it's, a, it's just sort of this sort of cell. So I make the flowers because they're this just unique celebration of life. And the Buddhists say that you are like the lotus, the bloom. You have the capacity if you sit in your swill don't connect, fall through space, don't hold on. You'll find that there's an opening that happens and that you can bloom and you can grow as a human being. I mean, isn't that why we're here? 
and all of a sudden I've got these parts and they're landscapes. So what I do is I work and I bring the piece together and then I find the next element that responds to it and I create, try to create a dynamic tension between the forms. And I essentially start to compose the landscape. And it, 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 it's clearly organic. It's clearly in motion. It's obviously absorbing light, passing color. It has a path and a movement. And it's supposed to bring a sense of motion and beauty and, uh, and uh, observation of space and tension between the forms. And it's just, it's, it's a, uh, so I took all these elements and I recomposed it on the plinth that was there in what I felt was a dynamic composition using pieces that I had made years ago. When you hang an object, it suddenly has more information, has different information. You know, it, 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 and everyone understands a chandelier, but for me, I'm creating stalactite, stalagmite, ice, flow, water dripping. So it's sort of trying to capture a sense of motion in a static form. And I do, again, it's one of the bodies of work that I do is hanging sculpture. Some of them are very abstract and some of them are more, um, have a pattern to them. This one has a more, uh, a stronger, more of an icicle, um, ice-like, water-like pattern to it. And what I do is I start by pouring long strips of glass and I made bronze cherry wood bark and I stamp the bark pattern and I slide this, it's still like a big noodle and I slide it over a pipe and it creates that shell, that, that long parabola. And then we slide that off the pipe and we load it into the annealer. While I'm working, I clearly work from a body of work. I didn't make this to make that to make this. I make lots of parts. I don't know if you know this, but that piece is called A Curious Conversation. And I make the artwork for, and, and it comes from sort of this, the need to create and the pursuit um, is my raison d'etre. I mean, it really is my reason for being. And I don't mean that like hokey, but it's like we all, like did I already talk about this? Like we all need to be doing something. We need to be productive to feel whole, but we all need some sort of purpose. And when you have a purpose, there's a freedom in your purpose and your endeavor. And when you honestly take on your purpose with joy, um, magic can happen. There has never been a piece of hot sculpted glass at that scale. And so I would always blow glass and then I'd come home and I would sculpt my little hands. I sent you those photos of those hands. I'm always sculpting because that's my nature. But and then I would blow and try to make sculptural statements in blown work. And Pino showed me I could just do it exactly. I could sculpt in glass, and that's when my career took off. I love a good. I love the challenge of pushing a material to a level that it has not been explored yet. But the physics behind making that, it took us a year just to sit and how are we gonna do it? And those, that torso is 100 pounds. You know, sculpting that torso was just, oh, it was just, it cooked me. It was just, you know, I mean, I'm all, it, it, it just, just gathering that much glass. I gather so much glass that I have to gather as much as I can and let it cool and gather another one and then shove the two together and break it off. And now I have a mass big enough to make a torso. You can't gather that much glass out of the, the aperture of the furnace. Along comes this amazing whirlwind of a woman named Trish in, into my life with Corey from the Habitat Gallery. And, um, she is just a dynamic force of nature, that woman. Very unusual, very, I mean, really just a force of nature. And uh, she's a wave. I love how curious she is about the world and her optimism. So we, we share that in common. And um, she's got a sparkle about her, you know, and uh, uh, I immediately was drawn to her personality. You know, she's just positive. And you know, you really, it's a choice. Life is nothing more than a series of situation. And it's your choice on how you're gonna to respond to that situation. You know, and like I said earlier, the car, I could be mad or I could just go, ah, oh, he's in a bigger rush than me. So how, how do I wanna run through my life? And that takes a conscious choice. I felt that in her. 
You know, this woman is choosing to be positive. This woman is choosing to make a difference. And she loves my work. She sees it. She sees the energy in my work. And she feels the joy. She feels the spontaneity. She feels that spark that I have. You know, I had, I heard she was collaborating with Bertil and Lino. And I'm just like, ah, my God, these are my heroes. Um, clearly, there's something very dynamic about this wonderful human being. I, I love the opportunity. Um, and... Um, she had already seen my work and collected a lot of it. It was wonderful. And, and you know, um, she, she's, she's a Medici. You know, she is. She just is determined to make a difference for the arts. So we're, it literally started on a napkin at, on, in the dinner uh, in, the, uh, in this great restaurant in Seattle. And we're having a wonderful meal. And I threw out this idea, what if we create these landscapes together, these immersive landscapes together? And we that talk about humanity and share the, the, the uh, begin to tell a story or a narration that one could relate to. You would see yourself in it. And then, um, which is what I have been focusing on. And then Trish says, oh my gosh, this is going to be magnificent in all her wonderful enthusiasm. Yes, you know, we started, we met at the studio, and we started drawing and she looked at me and she said, this piece has to be about the embitterment of mankind and the great souls that have come down to the planet that have made a difference. Because we have to honor and remind people that there are other souls that make a difference, like the Buddha, like Mother Mary, like Mahatma Gandhi, you know, like Moses, you know, like the Abrahamic religions, you know, Isaac and Abraham, you know, like this, you know, instead of the wars that are fought over that territory, let's talk about the, the love and the compassion um, that all of these people have, from Mohammed all the way down, that, that, that they've all spoken about. Aspects of every religion have a commonality of love one another, care for one another, be kind. Okay, so how, how am I going to take these instantly recognizable, iconic people that people, people of the world pray to and do it in an honorable way that doesn't offend, that honors the statement and what that person at that time in the world meant and has still to this day means to millions of people, but not, but integrate that in my sculpture so that it has the flow and it speaks to all humanity at that time, from the child to mankind, to, to man and woman. And, and the, why are all these flowing natural forms? It's because the unification of man is not separate from nature. I mean, that's really what the, what, why I make these abstract fig forms is that the, there's a, we are not separate from nature. We are a part of our nature, a part of nature, and only our mind separates us from nature. Let's make it more narrative. Let's put the great souls that have come and really affected humanity into the piece. And it was, a, it was a challenge. It was really hard. I was terrified to make Mary and Buddha and Gandhi. And really, yeah, I mean, terrified, like, oh my God. But it was like, wow, am I going to be able to do this successfully? And I think I really did. And then Mahatma Gandhi of, of peace and, you know, and nonviolence and equality, you know, um, and courage. Oh my God. Here's this frail, skinny guy who was just going up against the great holy British empire and he changed the world through his steadfast belief in human nature is kind and human nature can be aggression can be solved through peace or non-aggression you know I mean there's a million more people I mean what why isn't MLK in here why isn't it wasn't about all of the great souls it's about let's pick a few that we can wrap our hands around. I'm Martin Blank and I'm here at the Imagine Museum.